the book of Acts reminds us that the early church was dynamic. When they were dispersed to other regions by religious persecution, the followers of Christ brought with them the gospel. Consequently, the name of Christ spread like wildfire. Stephen's martyrdom, the conversions of Saul and Cornelius, and the founding of the Church of Antioch, where the believers were first called Christians, ushered in the growth of Gentile missions. The second half of the book of Acts is focused primarily on Paul's missionary journeys. A Bible scholar observes that Paul was like a hunted deer, leaving tracts of blood as he moved from one region to another, proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Yet, Paul says, In our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. Saul the persecutor, who became Paul the apostle, finds joy in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul, his partners, and co-laborers in the Lord's work were moved by the Holy Spirit to preach, teach, heal, demonstrate God's love in synagogues, schools, homes, marketplaces, courtrooms, streets, and wherever God leads them to call people to Christ. As we live in the last days of spiritual deception, secularism, persecution, and apostasy, what have we become as people of God? Have we become complacent, or have we remained dynamic and explosive as the early church? As the bride of Christ, are we still faithful to and in Him? Blessed Lord's Day, blessed Senior Sunday to all the seniors, but uh, I did not stand up because I'm not a senior yet, soon to be, but this is my last time to be sitting down. <laughs> well, uh, today is a special day. Before anything else, I'd like to welcome a special guest today. He's from Lahore, Pakistan. Pastor Yunus, can you please stand up? Kuram. He's a student on IGSL taking up further studies. And uh, if you're very familiar with what's happening in Pakistan, there's a lot of persecution happening. I was talking with him, and he mentioned that just last week, there were around 30 churches. He mentioned there were 30 churches that were burned down. It was burned down. And, and the more we hear of this kind of persecution that is happening, we should be more grateful and thankful that we have freedom to be able to worship here. We should not take that for granted, that we have this freedom. And perhaps after the service, we can connect with Pastor Kuram later. Maybe you can ask further how we can help in his ministry. <clears throat> Few years back, I had this opportunity, we had this opportunity, my wife and I, to celebrate our anniversary. And uh, one of the, we had, we celebrated in a cruise, in the Mediterranean cruise. And one of the stopovers we had was Izmir. This is located in Western Turkey. But in biblical times, it's known as Ephesus. Just to give you a brief background, no? the Emperor Constantine established the Eastern Roman Empire in 330 and named the capital Constantinople, which is present day. Istanbul. However, in 1453, the Eastern Roman Empire, known as the Byzantine Empire, fell to the forces of the Ottoman Turks, the Muslims. And since then, Turkey has become a Muslim country. The Hagia Sophia, the magnificent church built during the Byzantine time, was renamed the Hagia Sophia Grand Mosque. It's very sad to hear things like this happening. Because in Canada, in the US, in Europe, 
and even in Asia and Africa. The church, instead of growing, expanding, many churches are closing down. And many churches, these buildings that were formerly used to places of worship are now being used by other religion, other organization, other than a place of worship. As Christians and followers of the living God, we need to be very, very intentional in our walk with the Lord and obeying his commandments, even in the midst of persecution. We all need to heed his call of the Great Commission. Having Bible studies, attending access groups, uh, attending sp uh, spiritual seminars or hearing podcasts, it's very good because this increased our knowledge of who God is and who the God we are worshiping. But if that is all that we are doing, just increasing our knowledge, without doing any meaningful ministries, without extending help to people, then this is very alarming. Because the more we know, the more we are responsible and accountable to the Lord on Judgment Day. Repeat. The more we know, the more accountable we are to the Lord on Judgment Day to use this knowledge, these resources that he has blessed us with to impact the world. We need to keep on expanding the church to the world and not the world expanding itself to the church. That way, when we do our ministries, it's really not based on worldly wisdom not based on just pure strategies or methods or whatever, but it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Another trivia is the seven churches stated in the book of Revelation, these seven churches are all located in Turkey. Okay, going back to our Mediterranean cruise, right? So we stopped at Izmir, and then a bus took us to the city of Ephesus. The first thing we saw when we alighted from the bus is this. Next slide. Genuine fakes. What does it mean? Genuine fakes. Wow, itong nakita, daming, daming nag, uh, no, no? They're looking at it. No? Actually, genuine fakes, no? they're selling bags, watches, shoes. No? And kind of, you know, it's genuine, a fake. Pa, no? Parang, what ba yan? <laughs> Apparently, genuine fakes refer to as high-quality products having that brand name, but it's not the original. It's still a fake. Or the higher quality, but still a fake. So as we entered the gate in Ephesus, a glimpse of the ruins really stirred my imagination, what the city was like. So I'll give you a little tour of Ephesus today. The stunning ruins gave us how important this city must have been when Paul came here. 2,000 years ago, Ephesus was a major port city, and the Romans called the city the crown jewel of Asia Minor. At its peak, more than 400,000 people lived there and worked there, and the international trade was thriving. The magnificent Ephesus Amphitheater, which is the next slide, you see that? Grabe, no? Ganda. This amphitheater was mentioned in our passage today, no? 19, but it's mentioned in verse 21. You can take a look later. No? We had the opportunity just to go into the middle because I was wondering, oh, in such a small, like this, we need sound, sound system. But that big area, how can people be heard without sound system? But really, the Romans are really good engineers, no? Maganda yung acoustics nila. So when someone is speaking there, they could be heard and all that. And one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis, is located at the center of Ephesus, where male and female prostitutes serve the temple goers. The Library of Celsus, which at its prime has stored more than 12,000 scrolls, because dati wala pang book, no? paper was not invented, it, scrolls, made it one of the most famous and traveled cities in the Roman world for trade, for business, for leisure, for religion, and for knowledge as well. So Ephesus in its prime must be such a fantastic site. No? So into this paganistic 
metropolis, Ephesus. In our verse 1, said, Paul and his traveling companions entered. I believe Paul doesn't have much resources. There's no indication that he has friends there because it was not mentioned. And certainly there has been no advance party preparing for his arrival. mission trip We have advance party announcing and preparing. But here Paul didn't have all these resources that we have today. And Paul had no guarantee that such a diverse culture, such a paganistic culture, that anyone would even listen to the message that he would be proclaiming. But however, only trusting fully that when God calls him to do something, God will provide. I'd like you to jump to verse 10, Muna, before we tackle the other verse. Verse 10 says, this went on for two years. What went on for two years? Paul's stay. Paul was uh, preaching the word for two years, teaching. So that all the Jews and Greeks who live in the province of Asia heard the word of God. Does that strike you? Two years without social media, without trans good transportation. What it says? All. Lahat. Not in Ephesus lang. Ah. All the Jews and Greeks in the province of Asia heard two years. Wow. So our text today shows what Paul did and relied on for this great expansion of the church to happen. So there must be three things to do. Evangelizing, empowering, and discipleship. This is not new teaching. No? We all know this. No? The thing is that we need to be doing it. So the first thing is evangelize. Must keep on preaching the gospel. It says, go and make disciples of all nations. But before we go and make disciples of nations, we should go and share the gospel to the people. So first they may be able to know Christ and to become his followers. So here, my point one is, we need to keep on evangelizing both inside and outside the church. And I would maybe probably say, outside the church, I would understand why we need to evangelize. But inside the church, we are all believers. We are all believers. We are all churchgoers. So why do we need to evangelize inside the church? No, Not necessarily, no. The question is, what do you believe? What do we really believe in? Or some people may have different reason of coming here to church. In our passage today, Paul found 12 men. Can we go to the passage? Whom Luke described as disciples of John. So Luke has described these 12 men as already disciples, meaning they're already believers. Though not much information was given, but as Paul talked with them, he discerned that something was not right. Something was not complete. Something. That led him to ask the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? How did the men reply that they had not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit? So, no doubt, Paul explain to them about the gospel of Christ's death on the cross as a substitute for sinners of his resurrection from the dead and of his ascension to heaven. These men are actually believers. They believe in the message of John the Baptist. But it was not complete. They have not heard how Jesus had fulfilled God's preaching. Even though Luke calls them disciples, it is not clear that they were disciples of Christ yet. In a similar way, there are many people, churchgoers even, inside or even outside the church who believe in God and perhaps even believe in Jesus in a general sort of way. Perhaps he's a regular churchgoer, but perhaps not truly saved yet. The two diagnostic questions that was taught to us, no? Even right now, there's an EE class, the two diagnostic question, is a great way to find out how this, what belief that these people believe by, by the way they give their answers. The first question you all know is, if we were to 
We don't like to take the, say that word or die, no, but it's significant. If we were to die tonight, do you know for certain where you are going? Do you know for certain where you're going? Where are you? The second question is, if you were in heaven's gate, and God were to ask you, and you keep knocking, pasukin mo na ako, keep knocking. God would ask you, why should I let you in? What would you say? I'm a regular member of Jubilee. I go to church. These answers will reveal if we truly understood the gospel and who we are trusting for eternal life. A person must believe that Jesus Christ is God and fu fully God and fully man. He paid the penalty of sin and that we deserve and he died on the cross for our sin. And we must receive him personally as our Lord and Savior. Remember, remember this. Right teaching will give us right belief and right belief will lead us to right direction and right direction will lead us to the right destination. In the other words, man, wrong teaching give us a wrong belief. A wrong belief will send us to the wrong direction and the wrong direction will send us to wrong results or wrong destination. Example, we go out to Aurora Boulevard, turn right, we know it's going to Divisoria, right? Going to Manila. But I believe that I will go to Marikina if I turn right. I sincerely believe that I will go. Even though you traveled for one hour tour, you will never reach your destination because you have a wrong belief and you're going the wrong direction. Similarly, in what we are believing in today, we must be certain what we are believing is the true gospel or else we may be going in the wrong direction. So in our church, let us, stop, let us not stop preaching the gospel both inside and outside the church. In our different access group, fellowship, it's not enough. I mean, our church, it's not enough that our church is growing in numbers. We praise God. We see many, many new faces here at Jubilee. They're growing in numbers. But we must make certain that every member of Jubilee and their families will certainly receive that commendation from the Lord one day. Well done, good and faithful servant. And not the other words that the Lord may say. Depart from me. I know you not. Lord, didn't we do so much things for you? Didn't we uh, cast out demons? Remember that? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do so things? Maybe in our modern church, didn't we do so many ministries in the church? We do not like that one day the Lord will say, Depart from me. I know you not. So we must be very certain. Right belief, right direction, right destination. Number two, those who believe in Jesus Christ should confess their faith through baptism. I think Reverend Young already has preached about baptism last year. So we won't dwell too much on this. Because baptism is a public declaration of our faith. That we are serious enough to make a commitment that we... I am a believer and a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ and to follow him wherever he may lead. Number three, true gospel divides people. Let's read the Bible verse found in verse 8 and 9. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refuse to believe and publicly malign the way. So what happened? Paul left them. He took the disciples with them and had discussion daily at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Paul lasted for three months in the synagogue before the opposition forced him out. He was reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. I believe he took them to scripture, the Old Testament, to show that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. But what happened? Some of them refused and even publicly maligned the way. Publicly, I, I believe they also maligned Paul as well. You know? Often those who oppose the most are those who are most religious. 
Yeah? We take pride in our views. We take pride in our belief. We take pride in the religion that our hearts are already hardened. Tumigas na eh. I won't accept anymore. This is what I believe. No? Some would believe that their ways, our beliefs are correct. Their tradition and practices are correct, even though we point to scriptures that it's not biblical. Paul spent, what, three months persuading and debating with them. We see churches today are divided because some pastors that was hired had a different theological conviction. It's happening in many churches, maybe in the province as well, because there's a lack of pastors, so they will hire pastors, but with a different theological background. And they would go into the church and would banga on what the church actually believes in theologically. And soon the church is divided. No? Many people like to debate on non-essential things, like maybe different theological convictions, or maybe methods of baptism, the second coming, I'm pre-med. Hindi pala pre-med, no? It's a medical term. What's that? Pre, pre-trib. Pre-med, no? Pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. And they would argue so much, no? no? Different perspective, no? Dispensation versus covenant. They would keep on debating and debating and not anymore heeding the essentials, which is to spread the gospel. Paul no longer wasted his time on them. Yeah, after three months, he tried, he debated, and I know. But then after three months, he said, Amana. We left them and took his disciples and preach and teach in another area. Just imagine if Paul did not leave them and taught in another place, his time would be spent arguing and debating with these people in the synagogues instead of proclaiming the gospel. It would be, and earlier we read, after two years, the church, uh, the Jews and Greeks heard the gospel. That would not have happened if Paul remained at the synagogue and debated with them. So let's have wisdom. May the Lord grant us wisdom on when to let go of something and when to, uh, to go to another ministry. To expand the church, there must be the second point after evangelize is the empowering and equipping of the Holy Spirit. All who have truly believed in Christ Jesus have received the Holy Spirit. Here in verse 6, it says, When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. In Romans 8, 9, Paul asserts, If anyone does not have the Spirit of God, that Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Repeat. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him even if we are regular churchgoers. If we do not have the Spirit of Christ in us, Paul is saying, we do not belong to Him. Okay? So be very careful, brothers and sisters. Make sure that the Spirit of Christ is within us, is in us. Again, right teaching, right belief, right direction lead us to the right destination. Okay, let's go to the next one. Those who believe receive the Spirit through faith in Christ must learn to walk in the Spirit's power. I'll spend a little more time here. Now. Remember when Paul first walked into Ephesus, he had little money and resources. There was no advance party preparing for his arrival. Okay, Virtually nothing. All he had was God called him to do something. And he has so much faith that God will provide that within two years, imagine two years, all the Jews and Greeks, not in Ephesus, but in the province of Asia, heard the gospel. When we are doing ministries empowered by the Holy Spirit, it makes a lot of difference. Being passionate, being persevering, Coming on time, coming to rehearsal, coming to whatever, becomes so natural. 
because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, because we are not operating on our own strength anymore. Even though we'll feel tired, but because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we would make that commitment. No? I have attended many church, uh, I, um, church anniversaries you know, in different parts of the Philippines. No? Our churches celebrate their 20th, 25th, 30th. 40th. Our own church celebrated our recently and still celebrating our 60th anniversary. And praise God that through this year's, the Lord has blessed Jubilee in these 60 years. I'd just like to point out there's a danger as the church grows in its age or anniversaries. The more anniversaries, the more traditions we will be having, the more practices that we'll be having, and the more... Uh, rules and regulations that we're having. And sometimes we would let our experience in our business world come and try to influence us. That's why it's instead of the world, ex instead of the church expanding to the world, sometimes we are having the world expanding us to us, influencing us. Now we have seen how the Pharisees, you know, with very good intention, wanted to preserve the Jewish culture and Judaism. They keep adding to the Mosaic laws, Ten Commandments, to more than 600 laws. Imagine Ten Commandments against 600 laws. Regarding the Sabbath, it's only one commandment on the Sabbath. But in the Pharisee, there are 69 rules on the Sabbath. We were in Israel. When we entered the elevator, a lobby, and we were surprised there's a Sabbath ele elevator. <laughs> What's a Sabbath elevator? The elevator stops in every floor because they considered pressing the button in the elevator is a work and it violates the Sabbath. Pressing, it's work. Even walking for more than one mile is considered work. So, so many of these laws that the Pharisees says, what? They have good intention. They want to preserve the Sabbath. But it turned out very restricting. No? Even when Rome made Christianity its official religion, the church became rich, powerful, political as well. Several man-made teachings that's clearly not biblical were put into practices that eventually become traditions over time. You all know that the selling of, you're familiar with that, selling of indulgences? In the middle ages when St. Peter Basilica, which is now known as the Vatican, was being constructed, they need funds. So the head of the church issued a, we will be selling indulgences. What are indulgences? It's a monetary payment of penalty. But when you buy these indulgences, it can absolve you for your past sins. Your sins are forgiven if you buy these indulgences. And it can release someone to heaven. So if this is the, t again, wrong teaching, wrong belief, wrong direction becomes a wrong direction. So many, many people trusted in these things, and many, many people went to hell because of that, because of these kinds of teaching. Because it makes Jesus' sacrifice on the cross unnecessary for salvation, because pwede palang bayaran eh. I can pay the penalty of it. Deuteronomy said, and also Revelation said, do not add what I commanded you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I gave you. Do not add. Wag natin dagdagan. Wag natin bawasan. Di dagdag bawas, no? But keep the commands of the Lord your God. In my dialogue with many churches today also, when I go visit them, um, it's more subtle. No? In church, sometimes they would discuss with me. Uh, you know, some ministries are put on hold because perhaps it was God's will not to, not to have this ministry. But, all, but often it's about tradition. It's about rules and regulations that we have not done this before. Why should we be doing this, something like this? So we become more sensitive to the comments of others that we become less sensitive to the calling of the Spirit. 
kasi magko-comment yung tao eh. Kasi people might say something eh. And then we become not sensitive to the calling of the Holy Spirit. Because the second was just empowering by the Holy Spirit. Okay? We need to be empowered. Or it's about economics. Some churches doesn't have much budget. Like the church in Jerusalem. They, I mean, they send Paul to the travel with, without having a budget. But in some churches, they would say, if ministry is presented, they would say, may budget ba to? Wala. Uh, next year na lang, maybe when we have a budget. There's no more praying. There's no more seeking the Lord's room. We're looking at the economics of the church now. The capacity of the church to support. Not the capacity of the Holy Spirit of God whose resources are unlimited. We are looking at the limited source resources of the church and say that we cannot do it. And this is not right, brothers and sisters. If you want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, then we should trust the Holy Spirit like Paul did. We sometimes do not really trust the Holy Spirit. Even in our prayers, we ask Him to guide us, we ask Him to lead us. But oftentimes we have so many, especially churches with so many years of traditions, they would follow it. They would look at it. They would look at their, how they practice it. No more consulting the Holy Spirit. And that's a danger. Because we have placed the Holy Spirit in the four boxes, four corners of our own limitations, of our own traditions, of our own practices. If we are walking in the Spirit's power, we should boldly step out and let the Spirit lead us. Jesus healed people on the Sabbath, right? You, you know about that. Huh? It was not a normal thing to do during those times. And the Pharisees have certain traditions and rules regarding the Sabbath. And said this is a dangerous precedent that Jesus is setting because it's against our tradition. It's against our rules and regulation. But what did Jesus do? Jesus keep healing on the Sabbath because he was more sensitive to God's calling, to the Spirit's calling than to the comments of the Pharisees. The Pharisees and the Jews also do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of the elders. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, no, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? So the question right now is, think about it. Was Jesus a lawbreaker? Because he broke the traditions and rules of the Pharisees regarding Sabbath, regarding washing hands. Was Jesus intentionally breaking rules? Be what is your answer was he a lawbreaker? Because if he is a lawbreaker, then he's a sinner. And if he's a sinner, then he's not the sinless one from God who takes away the sins of the world. How did Jesus answer those accusations hurled by him by the Pharisees? Jesus answered, Why have you let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions? This is a very important reminder church, if we want to walk in the Spirit, if we want to be empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit, have we let go of God's commandments? And we are clinging on to our own wisdom, the worldly wisdom. The problem was in keeping the letter of the law, they omitted to do more important things like loving and caring for other people. Uh, let me just share this short story. It didn't happen here, but in other churches. No? There was an accident that happened in front of the church. So maybe it's a motorcycle. A person was lying there, needed immediate medical attention. And a churchgoer was there, a church member. He saw it. He went into the office and asked, the administration, if they can borrow the church vehicle to bring the injured person to the hospital because it's a matter of life and death. The ad admin officer being maybe a newly hired lung or, a, or not familiar, he said, wait, 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 let me look at our manual of operation. 
So he opened. Can we quickly? Wait, wait, I'm new here. <laughs> so open page one, page two. Oh, here it is, page 30. Oh, tagal, no? Page 30. It says, ah, only members are allowed to use the church vehicle. Oh, but, oh, wait, wait, wait. There's a section here that says, if a member would vouch for this, he can borrow. Oh, sige, sige. The member said, sige, sige, let me sign it. Let me sign it. So he signed a request form, the use of the church vehicle. But then it says, it should be signed by a approving officer. Oh, say, let me sign the approval. Sir, day, day off niya ngayon. <laughs> it's a day off. If I approved it, my job would be on the line. Brothers and sisters, you think about this. We laugh at it, but here, the, was the person right? Because the person was right in following the rule book. Because that's what the manual said. But he did not do the right thing because on judgment day, he cannot answer the Lord because I just followed the manual of operation. Because there is a much higher law above everything else. No? We live in an imperfect society. We need rules and regulations. We have good traditions we need to follow. And these rules and regulations will combat the worst forms of evil. Our society has its laws and rules. And we need uh, enforcement officers to enforce them to ensure law and order. The university has its, laws, has its laws. The church has its own laws. But here Jesus is saying, brothers and sisters, as his followers, if we follow his way, true love, true mercy and compassion would transcend all these other rules and traditions. May the Lord give us wisdom to be discerning and be sensitive to the Spirit's prompting, even if it goes against our normal way of doing things. Be willing to be interrupted. Be willing to be corrected. Be willing to change your plans. Do not be sensitive to the comments of others. We are so sensitive that we lost that sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's calling. And if we truly love others as we love ourselves, true love will transcend all things. Number three, discipling. Disciple. You know, church expansion cannot be sustained for long if we don't disciple them correctly again. Wrong discipling, wrong belief, wrong belief, wrong direction, wrong results or wrong destination. Okay? In our day, doctrine is not given much importance in, exp in our experience and emotions are exalted. No? You know, sometimes a speaker would dwell on topics that are liter a, a little deep, malalim, and we we be hear comments na nakakaantok naman tong speaker na to. Di ko na intindihan. Diba? But if experience and emotions are not rooted in sound doctrine, they will not be biblical and will not be sustained and will not sustain us to keep us from serious error. So to expand the church there in future generation, we must be faithful and devote ourselves to faithful teaching of God's word. Because the Great Commission tells us to teach them to what? Remember? Great. Teach them to obey all I have commanded. Not teach them to obey some of the things I commanded. It says all the things that I have commanded. And look what happened when these three things evangelize, empowerment by the Spirit, and disciple, you know, happen. No? All the Greeks and Jews who live in the province of Asia heard the word of God. Walang social media. <laughs> Tayo may social media, pero kapitbahe natin doesn't know that Christ. Our spirit of influence doesn't even know that we are Christians. It's so sad. As Christians, it is our mandate to share the gospel. A 
Undoubtedly, of course, many of the travelers who passed through Ephesus that was discipled by Paul took his message to go to the different areas. That's how the, that's how the word of God spread during those times. No? So Acts 19 is kind of long. No? So I'll just summarize the, the remaining. No? In verse 18, it says, Many of those who believe now came and openly confessed what they've done. See? A true indication that someone has, has become a true believer is they would openly repent and confess what they have done and confess that Jesus is his Lord and Savior. And we continue verse 19. A number who have practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the came to 50,000 drachmas. <laughs> the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of God spread widely and grew in power. Earlier, I showed you the ruins of the library of Celsius. Remember that? That's a big library where there are 12,000. Meaning that the Ephesians, the people of Ephesus, valued knowledge a lot. And to have them publicly burn these scrolls must have impacted the people. It says, wow, those things, they value a lot, this knowledge, these things. And now they're publicly burning it. There must be something or someone must have transformed their lives. I want to know what happened to them because I can see the transformation. And they said they publicly burn. Sometimes we have to be public. We have to go public with our faith. Let's not be secret agents of God. We have to go public. We have to let people know that we are his followers. No? And a climactic moment in, F in Paul's ministry in Ephesus was uh, there were 25,000 Worshippers of Artemis. I'm well, going to the last part. They brought Paul's companions and brought them to the amphitheater that I showed you earlier. And they were shouting things like, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They were shouting it for two hours. They keep on shouting it. Eventually, Paul left the city and left Timothy in charge of the church in Ephesus. Today, Ephesus lies in ruins. The economic victim of a harbor. There were, previously, there was a harbor in the, beside the theater, but now it was silted up. Naging lupa na siya, no? And here we see the temple of Artemis. Before it was like that, there are around 120 columns. Of mag That's why it's called one of the seven wonders. Of Today, if you visit, ito lang makikita mo. There's only one column left. It's a hard evidence that the Artemis of the efficient wasn't nearly as great as these 25,000 fanatics insisted that she was. On the other hand, Paul's message of Jesus Christ resulted in the conversion of billions, and his letter to the Ephesians is still being read, studied, and memorized today, 2,000 years later. And Paul, in his personal doxology on Ephesians, if I can find it in Ephesians 3.20, you go to that. Now to him, let's read it together. Now to him, we s that is at work within us. God is indeed able to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. Sometimes our imagination is too small. Our goals are too small. Our vision is too small. But God can use our five loaves and two fishes and expand it to feed thousands of people. The thing is, are we willing to offer our five loaves and two fishes to be in the use of the master? 
So the more impact of the gospel was more than Paul had ever imagined. Not many people want churches to grow in quantity. Because we see many our mega churches growing rapidly. Sana no? pareho tayo dyan sa ganyan, pareho tayo sa ganyan. But let us neglect the quality that we are teaching and how we are doing our ministry. The early church has given us the formula for expanding the church. What are this formula again? Evangelizing inside and outside the church. Let's not stop doing that. Number two, empowerment and equipping by the Holy Spirit. And number three, discipling. We need to teach sound doctrine because wrong teaching, wrong belief, wrong direction, wrong destination. But right teaching, right belief, right direction, right results, or right direction. You know, this sounds familiar, these three things. I, I think I read it somewhere in the church. Let's look, what church is this that have this kind of vision as well? Oh, it's Jubilee. It's our vision. It's the same vision. Let's read it together. It's our vision, and we should memorize it. Win equipped disciple. To honor the Lord, equipping them and discipling them to use their spirit-given gifts in the service. So these are the three things that Paul used that is also part of our vision. We just need not just to memorize. We just need not just to put it in our memory. We just need not just to put it, the vision in our walls of our church. Wow, at least the church is a vision. But if we're not doing it, then all these things are tantamount to nothing. So let's make a true commitment to glorify God by winning, equipping, and discipling. And God will bless our commitment by expanding the church to the world and not let the world expanding into the church. Amen? Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning that you have, uh, we have clearly heard your message. Lord, we need as Christians, Lord, we all know these things. We, need, we know that we need to evangelize. We need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We need to disciple. But Lord, oftentimes, we are doing it half-heartedly or we're not doing it at all. Forgive us, Lord, for being not truly committed to do your work, to do your great commission. Help us. This year's uh, theme, True Commitment, reminds us of these three things in our vision statement. To win, to equip and empower by the Holy Spirit, and to disciple. And we want to watch our, you do your part to expand the church that we could reach more and more people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise up for the benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be all glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation, forever and ever. Amen. reflecting and meditating on today's message and probably make a effort also to apply it in our lives plan and how we can apply this message in our lives god bless you